Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Hope everyone's doing right or doing all right on this uh, what is inevitably going to be incredibly hot day. Uh, looking forward to that. I know Betty Jean is, right? You're going to have the windows open, aren't you? 100-degree <laughs> weather. It's just getting warm enough to go outside then, right? All right. Uh, so we, we took a week off last week, obviously, because of our gospel meeting. Today, uh, we're going to continue with our study of the minor prophets. I did not, whenever I created this, the syllabus for this class, factor in the gospel meeting because either I forgot or I didn't know about it. I, I don't know which. Um, so the dates that uh, I sent out initially uh, are going to be off. There is a there is a slot budgeted at the end of the class for a review. So what we'll end up doing is just foregoing the review. Um, the last of the lessons 
uh, once we get through this, will be the minor prophets uh, in the New Testament. That's kind of a, um, a lesson where we'll take the things that we've talked about over the course of these last two quarters uh, and look at New Testament applications. After that, there was going to be just kind of a general comprehensive review, and I'm just going to leave that out. So, I mean, we're not going to be missing anything as far as content is concerned, uh, but at the end of the class, whenever I show the syllabus slide, those dates are going to be off. But we're going to have plenty of time uh, to get through uh, the rest of the, uh, the the rest of the content that we have after today, beginning next week, we'll start um, you know our forty year pilgrimage through Zechariah, uh, which is really only going to be about four weeks. But I mean that's still quite a bit of time, comparatively speaking, uh, uh, to to spend in a book. You know some of these we've like today uh, will take one class period for an entire book. Zechariah um, it isn't really conducive to that. Uh, so we'll do Zechariah, Malachi, and I can't remember if Malachi is one or two lessons, and then after that will be the Minor Prophets in the New Testament. Uh, and then that will be it for the quarter at the end of June, right? January, February, March, April, May, June. At the end of June, uh, that will be the end of this class period. So I am open to suggestions, um, you know, starting now as to what you would like to study up here uh, beginning in July. I like to alternate as much as I can between the New Testament and the Old Testament, since we spent six months uh, looking at the Minor Prophets, I would like to, uh, you know, talk about something in the New Testament. So if you have any suggestions, just let me know that. Um, I can't promise I'll consider it that much, but I'll consider it some. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's kind of what, uh, uh, what this class is looking like from, from here to the end of it, uh, there at the end of June. Uh, so today we're going to be taking a look at the book of Haggai, Haggai, Haggai. I've never heard two people say it the same way. I'm going to say Haggai just because I'm the one who's miked, uh, but I wouldn't put too much stock in that. Uh, if you notice, you find him right here, a contemporary with Zechariah, um, post-exilic technically, or I guess he's just exilic because uh, he is one of the prophets who uh, is instrumental during that transitionary period between the Babylonian captivity for Israel and Jerusalem uh, and, of course, their return to Jerusalem. He kind of splits the difference there. Uh, he's the tenth book uh, in, the, in the list of the minor prophets. His name means festival or festive because he was a super fun guy or because he was born during a Jewish feast. Probably the latter uh, is more uh, plausible than the, than the former. He is referred to as a post-exilic uh, prophet. I think that really just comes down to semantics and details and kind of where you want to put it um, on the timeline. And dating the book, for Haggai, it's actually easier than most uh, because these, these four oracles or these four concise messages that he delivered um, were delivered in the second year of King Darius, uh, which is the year uh, 520 uh, BC. Uh, and the text actually gives us an indication as to where on the timeline all of these lessons or these oracles were presented uh, in the sixth, seventh, and the ninth month. So, uh, you know, there are, there are plenty of prophets that we speculate. You know, we have these large events that are referenced as either in the future or in the past. So we kind of guess as to where they live on the timeline. <coughs> it's a little bit easier to kind of pinpoint uh, where he's at. Looking at the historical background of the book, um, really read Ezra 1 through 6, and, and there's the historical background uh, of Haggai. Um, before this, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they had taken Judah and Jerusalem off into captivity. We know that there were three stages uh, of those deportations, one in 605, one in 597, and then one in 587. Uh, the, first, uh, the first group uh, was when the temple treasures the, uh, and, and captives were taking. This is the group uh, that, that Daniel was in, uh, as well as other young men. In that second group in 597, uh, this is when Jerusalem was besieged. Um, this is where the king and his family were also taken. And then in that final, uh, well, is it pilgrimage? I don't think that's the right word. Um, in that final ushering, um, in 587, uh, this is the, you know, when Jerusalem was destroyed, when the temple was destroyed and everybody else was taken. Now, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied for 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And then after that, 
God would visit his people and he would restore them to the land. So this is part of God's promise. The land that they occupied uh, was, was included in the original Abrahamic promise. And this is something that we talk to the kids about a lot. As we go through the timeline of the Bible downstairs, uh, we, we talk about how in the beginning God made Abraham a threefold promise. So then you get to the captivity, and I always like asking them this, because uh, we note that Babylon took, uh, uh, took Judah into captivity, that Assyria took Israel into captivity, and now they're without the special land. That's what the kids call it as far as the, the threefold, uh, threefold promise. Part of that promise is the special land. So we tend to ask them, well, God's people are not in their special land. Does that mean that God does not keep his promises? Uh, and at first, you know, we got kind of the you know when you whistle at a puppy and they kind of go like this? Uh, that was kind of the looks that we got <laughs> from the kids at first because special land is part of the promise and they're not in the special land. But we emphasize the fact that God does, in fact, keep his promises. And we see that happening at this point of, um, of Israel's history or Israel and Judah's uh, history. God was always intending to restore them to the land. And this was fulfilled in 536 uh, Cyrus, uh, who was king of Persia at the time, made a proclamation that the people of Judah could return to Jerusalem uh, and rebuild the temple. So we have, um, you know, we have uh, two major stages where this takes place. 536, uh, which is the, the group of captives that were taken back by uh, Zerubbabel. And then in 457, uh, a second group of cap captives led back by Ezra. This is a very important point in the history of the timeline of God's people because the group that went back with Zerubbabel was charged solely with the task of what? Rebuilding the, rebuilding the temple. Absolutely. Once the temple was rebuilt, Ezra's uh, mission, if you will, was a little bit more ambiguous but no less important because Ezra, this is how we describe it to the kids, Ezra was charged with rebuilding the culture of worship, which, of course, the temple was a central focus to that. Uh, and then we know later on, Nehemiah comes along with the, uh, with the job of rebuilding the walls. Temple worship walls. That's kind, of the, uh, that's kind of the bullet points as far as the initial return of God's people from captivity. So the first group of captives comes back. Worship is restored under the leadership of, of Joshua, uh, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who was uh, the governor. <sighs> I'm trying to think. What was that? 536? Not that you care. Um, so that was the second, the second year of the return. That was 536. The rebuilding of the temple began with the laying on of, or with the laying on of foundations, with the laying of the foundation. <laughs> Um, and Ezra was sort of, uh, um, or sorry, we, we read about that in Ezra chapter 3, but what happens? They start, they lay the foundation, they get the temple built, or they get the temple started, then what happens? <coughs> resistance. And I'm working on a sermon about resistance, so this really stood out to me. It became difficult. I could go off into a tangent, but I'm not going to. But I want us to think about the significance of just coming up against resistance. And then what did God's people do? They folded like a road map. And they stopped for how long? Four years, Four years that time. And, uh, ultimately, how much time went before, or how much, uh, how much time off occurred uh, with the rebuilding of the temple? It would end up being 16 years that, that they just stopped. During this time, what were the Israelites focused on? Yeah, I was like, what did you do for a decade and a half? They worked on their own houses, their own businesses, you know, getting life established for them, and they completely lose sight or completely lost sight of what God had charged them to do, which was to rebuild the temple. So enter stage left, who? I would say it rhymes with, but I don't know that we've settled on a pronunciation. Yeah, <laughs> Haggai. Uh, his, his number one mission is to come in and stir up the people to rebuild the temple. And if you want to dilute the entire book down uh, to, you know, to, to one statement, it is that the temple must be completed. So he is going to encourage this to happen through the use of these four oracles, these four short, easily digestible, digested, yeah, digestible 
um, messages that he's going to present. That was a very, very long time uh, for uh, an introduction, <clears throat> but this is the first post-exilic prophet that we've studied in the Minor Prophets, or at least uh, uh, within this time period, so I wanted to make sure that we had a very clear ga uh, grasp on what the historical context was as we move forward. That being said, your initial impressions about the book. Go. Mm -hmm. They build a house. Oh, but it's not as pretty as Solomon. You know, so they're they got the priorities out of whack. Sure, they are very susceptible to resistance. And um, uh, you know, Jeremiah <coughs> took like seventy years. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, six oh six start the clock. Five thirty six exactly twenty years later, Cyrus signs the decree. Well, the temple's not destroyed until twenty years later, right? Five eighty six. When is the temple finally rebuilt? Five sixteen. Twenty years after. <laughs> Yes. And yet, <laughs> that's God's way of underlining and emphasizing that it's, it's, that it's him doing the work. Yeah, there's no, there's, there's no room really for interpretation uh, as far as that is concerned because the timeline is so solid, and I like that. Uh, it's very fun for all of you apologetics lovers out there. What else? Initial thoughts about the book. Right. And, and that is a, a key point in that, uh, appointing the, the leadership. You know, they refer to, and we'll look at this toward the end of the book, uh, as Zerubbabel, as this signet, you know, this person who occupies uh, a position of authority and that leadership, which we see is so important. And I think that concept is further personified through the walls guy, Nehemiah, um, because Nehemiah's leadership is also highlighted uh, in, you know, his efforts to rebuild the wall. So different context, but same concept. Uh, I, I think you're right about that. What else? Initial impressions or other initial impressions about the book? So oh, yes, sorry. Zerubbabel is uh, an important part in <coughs> God fulfilling his covenant with David out of 2 Samuel 7. Okay. Because he says, David, you can't build a temple for me, but <coughs> your lineage will. Solomon built the temple. Zerubbabel, a descendant of David, through both Nathan and uh, Solomon rebuilt the temple, mm -hmm. and then another descendant of, of David, descendant of Solomon, you know, uh, uh, built the ultimate temple in the church. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's a part of that uh, that that position that Zerubbabel occupies, kind of as type and anti-type, minor in a lot of ways. I mean, certainly. Uh, I wouldn't consider him a type in the same on the same shelf as like Aaron or Moses necessarily, but but yeah, that uh, you know he's he's definitely the way through the downstairs they called it the children of promise, you know, and you can underline the the genealogy of Jesus and see how God works His plan <coughs> down through the ages. Uh, Zerubbabel is definitely instrumental in that. No, go ahead. Yeah. I know it's not the way it's supposed to be, but stuff like that happens. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. There is a there is a point in this process where their confidence as God's people also needed to be restored. And I think about the uh, you know, of course I'm biased here. I think about the psychology of God's people coming out of coming out of captivity. What do they do now? Um and, and yeah, sure it seems simple on paper. Well, yeah, you go rebuild the temple. I mean Hello, have you ever rebuilt a temple? I mean, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of implication for that. And I think sort of getting, um, you know, getting shored up again uh, as God's people, because this is a completely different generation. Um, these people have, for the most part, only heard, heard stories about uh, before the exile uh, and, and what it was like. Uh, and, and yeah, really stepping into that identity 
there was some, some fear there, definitely some, some trepidation. Good point, good point. Okay, let's start uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is the first oracle here. Uh, consider your ways. Uh, this one is spoken by, by Haggai here. It is delivered in the second year of King Darius of Persia on the first day of the sixth month. That's given to us right there in chapter 1 uh, in verse 1. So the leaders of the people are Zerubbabel, who is the governor uh, of Judah, Joshua, who is the high priest, and the problem is immediately addressed uh, that the people have been procrastinating in rebuilding the Lord's house, that is the temple. Uh, and the reason for this is that the time has not come. That's what the people say uh, as far of uh, you know, as, as far as, you know, what have you been doing? Well, they say, well, the time hasn't come. One guy said this statement apparently became the dominant excuse for the uh, uh, inaction uh, in the years following the initial stoppage of work due to the discouragement of surrounding peoples. That's in Ezra chapter 4, uh, verses 4, 5, uh, and also in verse uh, 24. So the Lord responds then by asking the people if it is time for them to dwell in their paneled houses while... The temple does what? Lies in ruins. Uh, so he asks a rhetorical question here. Is it really time for you to just hang out in these cardboard huts, basically, while the, the house of God, the temple of the Lord, is, is still just uh, a pile of rubble? And I, what he's doing is basically using, using the reasoning against them. They've been so concerned... Um, making assumptions here, but that's the impression. They've been so concerned with making sure their houses are built uh, and that their businesses are thriving and that their families are taken care of uh, and just saying, you know what, we'll get around to this whole temple business uh, as if you know, rebuilding the temple was equated to the cleaning of the garage. You know, we'll get to it when we have time. Uh, and God points out the, the value of these two projects, uh, which I think is certainly an expandable concept. Here you are building these paneled houses, right? Um, is that really more important than the rebuilding of the temple? So by asking that question, is it time for you to dwell in these paneled houses? He's making the point that what you're putting your effort toward uh, is not nearly as substantial or valuable as, you know, getting your nose to the grindstone and doing the work that I have commissioned you to do. Thoughts, questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Chip and Joe level expert. Exactly. <laughs> um, while, you know, while God's dwelling in mud, essentially. Yeah. And his, his dwelling is nothing except in, oh no, the mud has actually just been knocked away. I'm glad you bring that out because that, that definitely pushes our mind past this idea that the Israelites were just scrimping to get by. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, we just need to find something so that we'll be safe and then we'll get to work. They had gone far beyond that, and, and, and that's a good point. you know. And even with all of the work that they're putting in to try to make this appear luxurious, yeah, I think that's fair, um, it still didn't compare to their responsibility for uh, you know, to, to rebuild the temple. That's, that's a really good point. So God comes in, and in light of this, he calls upon the people, and he says to them, consider your ways, or set your heart on your ways. That's verse 5. They recently endured these, these times of, of physical difficulty. Um, it, life had not been easy. I wonder why. Uh, their farming, their eating, drinking, clothing, wages, all of this had been very, very meager. So they're, in a lot of ways, they're house poor <laughs> um, because they didn't have necessarily the resources to be putting as much emphasis on their own homes as they were as opposed to rebuilding the Lord's temple. Uh, and then God calls upon them again in verses 6 and 7 to consider their ways. So the solution is to gather materials 
and build for God's pleasure the temple, uh, and in doing so, building glorification for God. Verse 8, and God reminds them uh, that it was he who brought them, or sorry, that he, it was he who brought the, the difficult times on them, saying, the reason that you're having a hard time getting money together, the reason that your harvests aren't what they ought to be, the reason that you're suffering from this or from that, is because I've caused you to suffer that, um, because you've become apathetic to your, your true calling, uh, you're leaving God's house in ruins while you're, uh, you know, worrying about your own stuff. Their priorities were completely misplaced, so God sends those difficult times to kind of snap them uh, back to uh, attention. And that's the first oracle. That's the, the first 11 verses of Haggai here. Haggai? See, I switched. <laughs> I'm code switching, and I didn't even do it on purpose. Haggai, Haggai. Somebody tell me how it's correctly pronounced. Haggai? I ain't doing it. Okay, yeah. I'm just going to cough every time I say his name. I'm going to be like, so I'm going to say Whatever, that's not important. Comments or questions, the first 11 verses. <coughs> that was a little cough. I didn't just try to say his name. <laughs> Go ahead. <coughs> um, there, there, there is another title for this, who did the building. Okay. Whether it was the wall or whether it was the temple, those were building blocks that people could use to build, build there. Mm -hmm. So, in order to make sure that the temple lasts or was equal to that, it was important to build the temple first to, to keep people from using those stones for their own temple. I didn't realize that. That's an interesting point. Because that, that's what now does with all the European stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the building project. Sure, sure. Well, and I think it certainly fits to the, the general criticism of the attitude of God's people because, uh, you know, to, to Amy's point, they're, they're working really hard to make their houses look special. I mean, I, I don't think it would have been completely implausible to assume that maybe they're taking, you know, bits and trinkets from the, the temple site. Uh, and incorporating them into their own houses for whatever reason. Now, we don't know that, of course, but I mean, I think, it, uh, I, I think it's certainly a possibility. That's an interesting point. I didn't, um, it, it makes perfect sense now. It seems so obvious now, but I didn't think about it, you know, 30 seconds ago before you mentioned that. Uh, I like it. I like it. All right, verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. Thankfully, if you have been waiting for four months for something happy to happen in the study of the Minor Prophets, congratulations, we're there. Um, the people obeyed. God uh, chastised them very strongly, uh, withheld blessings from them, corrected them through the words of the, of the, of the prophet. Uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the entire remnant, verse 12 says, they obeyed the voice of the Lord. Um, some versions say the, 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 that um, the people feared the presence of the Lord. Uh, and I can't help but think about uh, Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen here in, in in reading that they they got it. It reminds me almost of the, the the story of the prodigal son in the New Testament where it says he came to himself. I just picture this moment of clarity where uh, the the son anyway. It's like his eyes widened, and in the movies, you know, you would see all those flashbacks and all these scenes happening really quickly, and then you know, boom, you you close up on the character's eyes, and they're just wide with with understanding and and true sight. That seems to be the overall attitude uh, of God's people. They finally got it. They realized or remembered who it is. Um, they're, they're dealing with, and they responded behaviorally. So it's not enough just to say, oh, that's a good point, and then go right back to doing what they're doing. They said, oh, that's a good point, and they changed. God tells the people that he is with them. This is, uh, you know, to, to your point. He's with them as they prepare uh, their hand to do this work. This is verse 13 here. Um, then, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. So this is not only corrective. This is not only God being uh, disappointed or exasperated with his people. But this is God saying, come on, I'm going to help you do this. And, uh, and impart some confidence uh, into them. 
God stirred up the spirit of the leaders and the people so that only 23 days after uh, the prophet first spoke to them, the people had began work on the temple that had been ceased 16 years before. That's verses 14 and 15. So we see not only the change of heart, the change of mind, but we see the change in behavior just in these four verses right here. Uh, and that's such an incredibly powerful example and and source of encouragement for us to see after 16 years all right so uh, if you have that person who maybe hadn't been to church in a couple of months rem remind them that the israelites they stopped working for 16 years and they were able to get it um, there's a powerful point in that is that it doesn't matter how long you've been apathetic the opportunity for change the opportunity for repentance uh, it's, it's, it's always right there, right in front of you. Thoughts, questions, comments, verses 12 through 15. Okay. Yeah, it's not super complicated. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are, there are certainly <laughs> complex elements involved, uh, but when you, when you zoom out, and, and that's really the, the purity of, uh, I've heard it referred to as the purity of Bible ethics. From 50,000 feet, you know exactly where it's going to go. Righteousness is always rewarded. Um, wickedness is always punished. God's given us everything that we need in order to find him and to please him. You either take door number one or you take door number two. Yes, there are contextual complexities. Um, absolutely. There are things that individually on the, on the micro scale um, can, can make things more or less difficult, if you will. But really, the concept is, I mean, it's, it's very rinse and repeat. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of complexity uh, on the macro scale. Uh, and we see that playing out, I think, right here in a, really, uh, in a really legible example, in my opinion. Other thoughts? All right, so next... Uh, in chapter 2, we get into looking at the glory of the temple. The second oracle here is delivered on the 21st day of the seventh month to the leaders uh, and the remnant. Y'all remember the remnant? It showed up several times uh, in the pre-exilic prophets' uh, messages. Now we're seeing what this looks like a little bit. This is a month after the work had begun on the temple. Uh, God speaks to those who were old enough to remember the first temple in its former glory before it was destroyed by the Babylonians. And he asks them, how, how do you see this new temple being built? Um, in comparison, they considered it as what? Nothing. Nothing. This isn't even going to come close to the first one, right? How can you top Solomon's temple? Did you see that thing? Uh, I mean, wall-to-wall -wall carpets, central heating and air. I mean, it had the works, right? Just making sure you're paying attention. Um, and, and the idea is an, is an understandable one, right? If you remember the temple, but not only the, the structure and the, the ornament, but what it represented and how you felt as a Jew going to the temple to offer a sacrifice uh, and to see the carvings and to see you know, all of the details of it. How in the world could you look at this pile of rocks and imagine what it was before. So how does God respond? Yeah. He says, be strong, keep going, I am with you. They don't need to be afraid because God's faithfulness is based on the promise, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, this bond exists, and he points this out to them, between the covenant uh, and, you know, and the, the temple and between the people of God. And he's, he, he's really encouraging them and he reveals his plan once more. He's going to shake the heavens and the earth. He's going to shake uh, all the nations. Anyone who is going to come uh, to the desire of all nations, as he refers to it there in verses 6 and 7. Basically, God is going to shake down the planet to provide the resources needed in order to rebuild uh, this temple. Uh, the gold and the silver, they're all going to be claimed by God, verse 8. Uh, and it can't be ignored that, that the prophecy looks ultimately to the time of the Messiah and his kingdom. Uh, but the, the, the general uh, you know, punctuation on this is that this temple is going to be greater than the former. Now, how 
easily digestible do you think that fact is to those old timers who remembered what the, what the former temple looked like? I would imagine so. And I want us to think about that concept right there because this is, this is a love letter about trusting in God right here, this, this section. How many times do we look at something and say, that ain't going to work? <laughs> I don't see this happening. My life is too in shambles. I've strayed too far. I'm too set in my ways. I've been through too much. I don't know near enough insert chosen reason here how many times have we looked at a situation and thought there is absolutely no way and god says watch this and that's exactly what we see happening here yeah we're talking about pretty things in a building all right and i don't mean to reduce the significance of the temple but at the end of the day it's a really pretty building okay it wasn't god's end game uh this the, the temple was a stepping stone but the concept is the same. You want me to turn the entire world upside down? Let me take a bunch of dusty rednecks and turn them into basically the genesis of the gospel message for salvation. Um, I mean, oh, you see this dead guy over here? Watch this. Uh, you see this person who's sick? Watch this. Can't see? No problem. Dug yourself into a pit of sin? No problem. Let me show you how I'm going to fix that. And the point is, is that with our eyes and all of our finite wisdom that we are so proud of all too often, we look at something and see the impossible. And that gives God the opportunity to say, sit back, don't say anything, don't touch anything, just watch this. How many times do we need to be reminded of this thing right here? Thoughts? Uh, I, I need it a lot. I'm glad you said that. I was going to feel really weird if I was the only one. Yes, sir. So when I jump the gun, the next thing you learn is that everything that was accomplished in everything that is with the restoration, it didn't come about because of human might or power, but by the Spirit of God. Absolutely. We can't. So we need to stop trying. You know, uh, you know uh, it's God who always heals the injured. So yeah. So <laughs> you're absolutely right. So we went through this phase in our marriage, Kim and I, and maybe this was before LED light bulbs, I don't know. <laughs> I would be walking out of a room, and as I'm like crossing over the threshold, she was like, did you turn out the light? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, got it. So the uh, next day, I, you know, I'm walking out of her. Did you turn out the light? Well, finally, in all my exasperation, and I said, if you would give me 10 seconds, I might just amaze you <laughs> with my ability to remember to turn out the light. And the thing was, and this was very lighthearted. I mean, this is not something that we, like, went to therapy for or anything like that. Uh, we couldn't afford therapy back then anyway, <laughs> which is probably why she was telling me to turn off the light. Who knows? Um, sorry, I'm working through some things up here now. <laughs> A lot's happening. Um, the, the, the point is, is that, you know, sometimes we can be very, very short-sighted in, in how we anticipate something to unfold. And I wonder how many times God thinks, you know, just give me 10 seconds and I might amaze you. Just give me a chance and watch what I can do. And I know we don't like to we don't like to, to think that we wield that much power that we could actually, you know, stop the God of the universe in his tracks. And I understand that functionally speaking, we can't. But man, we can, we can sure, figuratively speaking, cut the legs out from under him. You leave that Bible just sitting on the coffee table all dusty and pretty, but never opening it, never reading it, never receiving with meekness the implanted word, never stepping out in faith, never trusting, which is a behavior, not a feeling, by the way, uh, as I've mentioned before in the past. I mean, how many times do we limit what God can do in our lives because of our lack of faithfulness, because we rely on our eyes? You remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about faith, and we referred to faith as the blindfold. You know, if we're going to walk by faith, not by sight, we don't rely on what we see. We rely on what God has promised. And understand that that's not always easy, all right? If it's that Indiana Jones moment where there's this big pit right in front of you, and now it's like, oh, sure, I'm going to step out onto thin air. And sometimes it feels like that. But God does not operate based on physics. <laughs> he operates on promise. 
And if we rely on that promise, then, then we have the opportunity to truly enjoy what he's prepared for us. And I realize I'm taking a very specific story and just, you know, blasting it into a million bits as far as application is concerned. Um, this is about a building. Is the new building going to be as pretty as the old building? Um, and God says, yes, that made absolutely no sense to them, I would imagine. But what did God do? He made it better than the former. He did what he said he was going to do. Uh, and I think that's such an important and, quite frankly, a valuable application. Because how much happier would we be? How much, uh, you know, how, how much, or how safer would we feel? Is that right? How much more security or safety would we feel in our own lives? if we truly relied on God and then let him carry out in our lives what he said he was going to. I don't know. Sorry, that turned a little preachy there. Occupational hazard. Thoughts? All that? You got nothing? I thought that was pretty good. Go ahead. Listen, Go. The Lord was trying to think of some greater than the former. Uh, I know that you have two simple destructions, probably eight, 13, 30 I mean, I, I think it's a combination of all of that, and, and, and yes. I mean, I think, I think functionally, aesthetically, um, the, the, the temple that was destroyed, uh, you know, in the 500s, um, you know, that was because, because Haggai's talking to the former generation who would have known that temple. So I think we, we understand that that's the former that he's talking about. Uh, and, and I think the greater has a double or maybe even a triple meaning. Um, you know, whether it's going to be bigger or shinier or prettier, I don't know exactly uh, as far as the aesthetic or the construction of the temple. But ultimately, this does, and, and we'll get into this toward the end of, of chapter 2 as well with the mention of Zerubbabel, all of this is pointing toward the Messianic kingdom. Um, I, and I don't think that, uh, that God telling uh, the, the people here that this temple is going to be greater than the former, I don't think it's only because it's going to be prettier and shinier. I do think that he is directing our minds forward. I don't know if that's... Yeah, I, I don't know if that's answering your question or not, but I'm I'm trying. Okay, okay, I'm with you now. I don't I don't know. I would have to, because that that steps into like the 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 historical background and stuff that I'm not sure of. Other thoughts. Okay, are we at the third oracle? Oh yeah, we're just making great time. This is only two chapters, you guys. Um, the third oracle, the people are unclean. So there's, a, there's an important concept that's brought up here. Uh, this is the 24th day of the ninth month, for those of you who are keeping up with the calendar here. Uh, and here the priests are asked whether holiness can be transferred from one object to another. And the answer is a resounding no. No, you cannot impart holiness holiness upon another person by, you know, by transference, I guess. Then they're asked, can uncleanness be transferred uh, from one to another? And the answer is a resounding yes. yes. What's the point? The point is the people are made unclean, or sorry, they were unclean because of their failure to rebuild the temple. So the overall message here is that procrastination is unclean. Sorry you had to hear it from me. I know some of you are going to be on the front row this morning after hearing that. Um, no, they had put off, uh, they had ridiculously put off the building of the temple, um, which means that because they hadn't been doing what they were supposed to be doing, that this rendered them uh, unclean and that all the other works and offerings that they did were also unclean. Verse 14, they had endured these hard times when the Lord warned them by, by withholding blessings. Remember, he made things difficult for them. Uh, crops, money, all that stuff. 
but they did not turn back to God then, verses 15 and 17. Now they've begun to do his will again, and God promises that his blessings will begin from this day forward. So what that shows again is the purity of Bible ethics. Yes, God is trying to be encouraging. I think God is much more... Um, uh, what we see here is, is that God is, is working to stir them up and motivate them more than to smash them down uh, for their wickedness. And we've certainly seen that happen uh, in, in former prophets. But even though he wants to encourage them along and really you know, say, hey, I'm with you. The new temple is going to be super pretty and it's going to be great. And you guys can do this because I'm going to help you and all this fun stuff. He still has to maintain the sense of justice that is consistent with his character, which means God cannot bend even for you. He didn't do it for his people. Then he's not going to do that for us. Now, that doesn't make him rigid uh, or unmerciful. In fact, it's quite the opposite because God has given us the opportunity through Jesus ultimately um, to, to be justified, to be sanctified, to be made clean. So he doesn't have to change his character uh, instead, he provides us the way to where we can be changed in order to meet the requirements for his holiness. Does that make sense? Not questioning your intelligence as much as my delivery, just to be clear on that. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. I hope this isn't too much of a stretch, but the principle of transference of holiness and unholiness. Um, if you have two fellows, same size, same weight, same musculature, stamina and endurance, <coughs> get more ropes and you're having to do a tug of war, it goes off. Okay. okay. Well, let's say you elevate one of them. One of them gets up there. What's going to happen? Like in Star Wars, the high ground. Well, get the other way. Yeah, that's true. The point is. Because gravity. It's always easier to pull down than to pull up. Okay. <coughs> a negative influence is always going to be stronger than a positive influence. That is why we need to be a positive influence but we can't just rest on that. Our positive influence backs up our teaching and preaching. If we think smiling big and trying to love your neighbor, you know, extending a hand is going to convert the world, not. That just proves that what we say is serious with us as we live those things. Fair point, fair point. I don't think that's too much of a stretch. I mean, I don't think that's the intent of this passage, but I'm, but I'm here with you, you know, I mean, and, and that's the thing, you know, when we talk about this a lot, the Bible is not really up for interpretation, but we're all going to read something and find different ways to apply that, and I think that's fair, uh, as long as we're not trying to change what the scriptures say, um, you know, you might read a passage and think, oh, well, this makes me think I need to, you know, really go talk to my neighbor or something like that, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah, I like the, uh, Jeff and I went to lunch the other day, and we were talking about that at, uh, you know, it's like Matthew 5 is not evangelism. <laughs> you know, letting your light shine is not the same thing as teaching someone the gospel. Yeah, it's important, uh, but one does not necessarily equal the other. Cal, what are you doing up here? Is your class over? Should I wrap this up? Should I finish this up? Okay, Cal says I have to finish. So um, let's talk about Zerubbabel real quick. We've, we've already talked about this a little bit, so we don't have to, uh, we don't have to dig too far into it, although we could. Um, the fourth and final oracle is all about Zerubbabel. Um, he is, you know, he's, he's been chosen as a signet ring. Now, that's the ring uh, that a king or, or a person of importance would use to seal a parchment that might contain official information or uh, a decree or something like that. We know Zerubbabel was in the royal bloodline of David. He was uh, the grandson of King uh, Jehoiachin, um, Jeconiah, Kaniah, all those guys. Um, and as the destruction of Judah and the Babylonian captivity loomed, God told Jehoiachin that uh, though he were a signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. So again, this comes back to does God keep his promises? And the answer to that is yes, because I would imagine that the day that the last of the Israelites were being carried off in the direction of Babylon, things looked pretty bleak. They probably felt very hopeless. Now we see the fulfillment of God's promise. Uh, we've already noted that Zerubbabel uh, would ultimately uh, be in this royal bloodline from which, uh, or came, came from David, but also uh, from which the Messiah uh, would be born. This is, you know, th this is the, the point. This is where our minds are pointed or the direction our minds are pointed in. The Messiah and his kingdom are the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to 
uh, Zerubbabel. Um, and fun note, uh, is the temple uh, it was completed in 516, only four and a half years after these oracles of Haggai were given. So 16 years of rest, Haggai comes in, or God through Haggai comes in, whips them into shape. Four and a half years later, uh, and the temple was built. I haven't cleaned my garage in four and a half years, but they built the temple. That shows you what God can do and seen. Next week, Zechariah. Oh. <sighs> Just imagine it's up there. Zechariah, I need to look at what, I think the first four chapters. Yeah, Zechariah chapters one through four. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Good class. Good comments.
Good morning, church. Good to see everybody here. I want to wish all the mothers out there happy Mother's Day. Glad you could spend spend the morning with us. Uh, I want to personally welcome everybody here to Hub City, members and visitors alike. We want all of our visitors to know that you're our special guest and we can. Uh, we would also like for you to fill out one of our visitors' cards so we may have a record of your visit. And if you have a chance to linger after services, we sure would like to meet you in person as well. At least one version of the COVID is still with us, as several of us have experienced. Since some are not immune yet, we need to exercise some precautions to help prevent the spread to our brothers and sisters here in our Hub City family. Just want to point out for our visitors that we do have a room in the back for babies and uh, the bathrooms are in the hallway uh, on the back side of the building. At this time, I'll read some scriptures I've selected to open this morning's service. If you'd like to follow with me, I'll be reading from Pro uh, Proverbs uh, 31, 10, starting in verse, in verse 10. Again, that's uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of, of gain. She does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, willingly works her with her hands. She's like a merchant ship's. She brings the, her food from afar. She also rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her, and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp go, does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine, linen, and purple. Her husband is known in the gate. When she sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And on her tongue is the law of the kindness. She watches over the ways of the household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is passing, but a woman who fares the Lord shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. With that, let's open our minds, hearts, and ears to the lesson. Concentrate on our service to the Lord. Leave the world outside while we worship. Thank you. Good morning. Start with 218, 218, Hosanna. After this, we'll have uh, a prayer. Mm. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my 
now be led in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the bright, sunshiny day. We thank you for all that are here, uh, people that are uh, members, and we thank you for all the guests that are here. We thank you for uh, the time that's gone into all the lessons this morning and uh, classes downstairs and up here, and thank you for all that work. Uh, thank you for helping us to uh, grow closer to you and help us to be more like you as a result. Uh, Thank you for uh, the time that we've had here this morning. In your son's name, amen. Four eighty three, seek you first. Four eight three. Song before the Lord's Supper will be 235. I gave my life for thee. 235.
morning. I picked up a Bible this morning that I don't usually carry. I, uh, the first thing that fell out was uh, my dad's announcement from his uh, funeral back in 2017 and the notes that I had prepared for his eulogy that day. And I was struck by how that's both a sad moment and a joyous moment. There are so many things that I see and, and think about that remind me of my dad, whether it's uh, when I see a trout, I always think about the times we fished together, a table saw, uh, a shop that's uh, organized and clean. Uh, my dad was a special man, and, and I'm grateful that I had him, and I look forward to seeing him again. We're taught in several Bible verses of the remembrance of the Lord's Supper, the night before Christ knew what he was about to experience on the following day, that he would be crucified, he would be tortured, he would be mocked, so much so that we know that he pleaded with God to if it was possible to let that cup pass from him. At the same time that we feel the remorse and the pain that was, that our Christ experienced that day, we're also comforted by the words of the purpose of that sacrifice. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel angel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Generally, Father, we come to you at this time mindful for the sacrifice that your son gave for us, he came, he suffered as we suffered, he was tempted as we are tempted, yet he willingly gave his life in the most cruel manner that we might have an avenue that lead, uh, leads us to your eternal kingdom. As part of that example, he asked us to break bread in remembrance of his body, be mindful of his sacrifice, but at the same time, hopeful for the gift that he has bestowed upon us. In your most gracious and powerful name we pray, amen.
after he had broken the bread and shared it with the apostles around the table, he continued with a cup of wine, asking them to drink that in remembrance of his blood. Blood signifying the end of life and at the same time rebirth. We too are commanded to drink of the cup and remember his sacrifice. Most Heavenly Father, we continue our offering. We ask that we be mindful of your sacrifice, that we enter into this with a mindful heart. We ask that you give us the strength and the patience that we might be an example into a dark world around us. In your most graciously name we pray, amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. Sing 488, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. 488. We're now given the opportunity to give back a portion of the many blessings that we have been given so that we may further the work here at the church. It's an opportunity for us to demonstrate our willingness to let go of the material things that God has so richly blessed us with. Dear Heavenly Father, thankful for this country that we live in for the opportunity to come and, and worship without persecution. We're thankful for the many rich blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We're thankful for the leadership that you have given. We're grateful for the opportunity to give back so that we might further your cause. We ask that you use this gift in ways that we do not foresee so that it may lead others to your heavenly kingdom. In your most heavenly name we pray. Amen.
Song for our lesson will be 609. We give thee but thine own. 609. If you're able, please stand for this song. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounty desire, as to us true be seated. Invitation will be 493. 493. Good morning. morning. All right. I know we had a gospel meeting last week. You know, I had a week off. Good morning. Okay, that was a little better. Hope everyone is feeling good and well rested. Uh, Hope you moms have had a good morning so far, my wife certainly has. I got uh, woken up this morning about 6.30 by a very frantic Davis, and I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I am not a morning person, uh, so the fact that he came to my side of the bed shows absolute desperation, and I opened my eyes, forgetting what day it was, and I'm pretty sure the first thing that I spoke today was, what? <laughs> Uh, and he looks at me and he goes, Dad, I'm having a panic attack. I completely forgot how to cook eggs. Um, so he was going to uh, make breakfast for his mama, and he did uh, very successfully, by the way, once he remembered how to cook eggs, which is a you know skill you can take straight to the bank. Uh, I want to talk this morning about the the story of the widow and her contribution, which I realize is ironic, but I've been creating awkward moments since 1982, so I figured this Sunday morning should be uh, no mistake as I chose Mother's Day to talk about a childless woman. Um, But I do want to, I want to take a look at what God gives us through this lesson about money, and I want us to look at it from the lens of, uh, I I guess, pushing beyond the, the monetary component to the story here. I mean, you, you think about how we talk, right? Some people, they're, you're going to buy a car for, for $20,000 and then spend the rest of your life telling people that they drive a $30,000 car. Uh, there are some other people uh, who haven't paid full price for anything since the late 70s uh, and will, will brag about how little they, they spend on something. Um, I know those of you clearance rack shoppers, I'm married to one, so I know she is not alone. Uh, I joke and, and say Kim hasn't paid full price for anything in probably the past 20 years. Um, and, and, and sometimes that's worth noting for us. And I think regardless of the perspective, as, as Christians, we like to pride ourselves on the fact that, well, we don't like to think about material things, but, but guys, we think about material things. Um, I don't think that's the same thing as being materialistic. In fact, I think we probably do ourselves a disservice by trying to convince ourselves and other people, it's like, oh, we don't care about money, we don't care about you know, physical things or anything like that, but we do. 
So isn't it a better use of our time or better use of our energy and resources to think about how to manage that and make sure that we do that in a godly way? And for those of you who are, who are here who still maintain that you don't care about your money, um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. You can just write me a check for it. Um, and uh, Kim's Mother's Day present just got a whole lot better. <laughs> You know, we do care. So let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Let's be accurate uh, with our thinking. Let's be honest uh, with ourselves. So through this lens of money, we have a very interesting story that's found in the scriptures. This is Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41. And this is during um, his, his, uh, his teaching in Jerusalem. This is after he was teaching in, in Jerusalem. This would have been on Tuesday, uh, which would have been the last event of the public ministry of Jesus. Jesus uh, decided to have, have a seat near the temple uh, and do a little people watching. And what he observed there was significant enough that he chose to share his disciple, or sorry, share his findings with his disciples, and thereby showing us the relevance in our lives today. And what he observed from a poor widow would ultimately become the precedent for giving at least as far as the condition of the heart and the mind is concerned. So what I would like to do this morning is revisit the narrative that is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. And I want us to become reacquainted with this story from the life of Christ. This is a story that I absolutely love. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm presenting that to you this morning. Uh, also, it's a story that's very well known, which is another reason why I'm preaching on it this morning, because if there is one thing that I've learned in almost 20 years of preaching is that the Sunday morning after a gospel meeting, you keep it short and you keep it simple. And I'm going to try to do both for you, um, both for you this morning. I want from this, though, each of us to take the opportunity to examine the state of our minds and our hearts when we make the conscious choice to give to the Lord. And I realize that that contribution, that that part of our, uh, our, our, of our service has passed this morning, but I do not believe that these principles only have to be applied to giving. Yes, that is the direct context. I don't want to be unclear about that in any way, but what about our energy? What about our time? What about our other resources that we give? Do we come to the table with the same sacrificially minded attitude that we see exemplified here in Mark chapter 12? So let's take a look at the text here. If you want to look at it up on the screen, you're certainly welcome to do that. If that's uh, illegible for you, then I encourage you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. We're going to take a look at verses 41 uh, through 44. Uh, the very first verse here in 41, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. What possibly could be the relevance uh, of verse 41? Well, we know that there were receptacles near the temple where people could simply walk by and drop in their money. I imagine, you know, a big wooden hopper or something like that, maybe with a slit in the top where people would walk by and they would drop in that contribution. Um, it wasn't nearly the formal practice that we observe today. It wasn't a, hey, we're all seated and, uh, you know, we're here at the same place in the same time and we're going to pass around a basket or a plate or something like that so that you can make your, your contribution. It was something that people could do freely uh, and kind of as they chose, as they would have been um, you know, bustling around the temple on whichever day they were there. When the people would come to Jerusalem, this is how they gave uh, their money to God. Uh, there was likely also a place where you could give things like wood or incense or sacrifices uh, or, or things like that. I envision, you know, perhaps large baskets or things like that. The point is, is whatever it was, if you were a Jew during this time, whatever it was that you had intended to offer to the Lord, uh, there was a place at the temple for you to do that. And Jesus was sitting opposite where this took place. So he, he was sitting in a very intentional place and watching this practice unfold. And what he observed uh, was the following. He said, many rich people put in large sums. Now, I know that we open our Bibles and we see the word rich and we automatically picture a villain, but I want to discourage you from thinking that way. Uh, I don't want us to get this, the, the idea that the only way to be righteous is to be poor uh, and that somehow financial success or monetary gain uh, is inherent of worldliness or wickedness. It is not. What he, uh, he observed was that there were people who were wealthier who were dropping in quite substantial sums of money. Uh, Notice the text does say that many who were rich gave large amounts. So there were some people who were there who were most likely wealthy, but maybe they weren't uh, contributing these large amounts. But there is nothing wrong with this. There is certainly nothing wrong with the fact that they were giving large amounts. I don't want us to look at stories like this and polarize the characters like, oh, well, the widow was poor, so she was a good person. And the rich people, you know, they, they were given a bunch of money, but uh, they, weren't as, you know, they weren't as intentional as the poor widow. 
it's, that's not a fair assumption to make. In fact, if you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 36, um, when the, the tabernacle was being built, you'll find that the people were commissioned to, to, to contribute resources to make that happen. And there were plenty of people who were giving exorbitant amount, uh, amounts of money or building materials or resources or things like that, uh, and that was perfectly acceptable. So there is nothing unacceptable about the wealthy people mentioned in this passage who were putting in these larger sums of money. But that's not what Jesus chooses to zoom in on as he, uh, as he tells this story. Verse 42 is where we kind of get the, the heart of the story, right? And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make uh, a penny. So he observes this contribution that the widow made into the treasury. Now, I use the English Standard Version. That's what I study from, and that's the version I use whenever I preach. Other versions, you've probably heard two mites, which make a quadrants and things like that. Nobody knows what a quadrants is, um, but uh, we'll talk about that for a second. The point is, and it doesn't matter the, the mathematical conversions necessarily, but the point is, is that the two coins that she placed into the treasury, most scholars say they added up to be about 1 64th of a day's wages. So if a day's wage at the time was $25 a day, then the coins would have been worth less than 40 cents each. I actually did some math, which should terrify you on so many levels, uh, and it should also make you take what I'm about to say with the teeniest grain of salt, because there's a chance that I messed this up. But if my iPhone calculator is correct, then if a, uh, if a person today has a $60,000 a year salary, okay, that's just kind of a, kind of a general number uh, that I came up with. They're working five days a week, Monday through Friday, whatever. Their daily wage would be, would be roughly $250 a day, which would make the widow's contribution in that scale $3.90. But that is not $3.90 in your pocket, uh, knowing that your bank account is full. That's $3.90 to your name. All right, now, you could eat off the Mickey D's dollar menu for $3.90. It might go a little bit further at Taco Bell. Uh, it might go even further at, what's that um, awesome taco place over by LCU? It's like Wolf Taco or something like that. You could buy like nine tacos there for that. I don't know. Uh, the point is, is that this was the last little bit of money that she had. If you have two pennies in your pocket today, you ain't eating on that. All right, that's not gonna, that's not gonna matter. Even if it's your last two pennies, it's not gonna add up to anything. The point is, is that when she gave, when uh, the text will later say that she gave what she had to live on, she could have legitimately used that money for something else. In the same way that if you had four bucks in your pocket, I mean, you're not, you're not walking onto a car lot necessarily, but at the same time, you're not going to bed hungry or as hungry um, as you would otherwise. So Jesus makes this conclusion that's really confusing to many, uh, and this has to do with the not only the amount of money that she put in, but the, the attitude with which she contributed. Uh, and he says here, and he called his disciples to him and said, truly I say to you, this poor, wid uh, poor widow has put in more than all these who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything that she had, all she had to live on. So, I mean, that four bucks, that last four bucks that you might have in your pocket, again, it's not going to save your life, but it's going to give you another day, right? But Jesus stated that in doing so, she had given more than all the other people who had contributed to the offering box. I mean, there are people who were just dropping in buckets of money into this offering box. She drops in her two little dusty, dirty, ugly coins, clink, clink, and Jesus says she is given more. Now keep in mind that the disciples have been famously confused throughout the majority of the ministry of Jesus. There have been plenty of things that Jesus has said to which they replied with a scholarly, what? Um, because it didn't make any sense. Um, all of this stuff about a spiritual kingdom and a physical kingdom, I mean, up until the night uh, before, G or the day before Jesus died, Peter's ready to sword fight in the garden over the physical kingdom versus the spiritual kingdom. So we know that they didn't have the clarity that we have now having all of the scriptures, that they were still scratching their heads at a lot of this. So I, I would imagine that hearing that this poor widow who had, who had dropped in her two measly coins, that how she's given more than everybody else, that that would not completely make sense to them. 
But I just wonder if at this point they're just like, okay, we're just going to roll with it because it, uh, um, you know, they had been they had been shown the truth and so many things uh, so many times. But he explains his reasoning behind this statement, saying that she had given out of their abundance, or sorry, that they had given out of their abundance, but she had given everything that she had to live on. So what do we do with this? Uh, I think there are a couple of things that we learn, and then this lesson will be yours this morning. Um, number one, this was intended to be a lesson. Not only the disciples who were with him on that day, uh, but for all the disciples, both past and present. Jesus saw what had happened, and he said, hey guys, come over here. He, he summoned his disciples. He called his disciples to come to him because he wanted to explain what he had seen. So regardless of, uh, of, of whatever else is going on, this was significant enough that it got the attention of the Lord and encouraged him to share it with his disciples. It was the lesson that he wished to share, but why? Why is this woman deserving of? of our intention. What is it that we are supposed to take from her gift? I mean, why does it matter? Well, we're not living the, during the same time. We're not living under the same circumstances. What could this possibly matter? And I think that will unfold as we continue to talk about applications. But the point is, is that it doesn't matter. That Jesus could have highlighted anything that he noticed that day. I mean, this, this contribution probably took all of five seconds. How many other five-second increments of time had Jesus witnessed that day that he could have found some way to teach on or to, to share a lesson, but he didn't. He chose this moment, and he did that to provide a lesson not only for his disciples but for all of us as well. I think the first thing that we can learn from the example of the widow and her two measly coins uh, is the value of a gift and how such value is determined. One commentator said, it's well to remember that God measures giving not by what we give, by what we, but by what we keep for ourselves. Another said, the value of a gift is not the amount given, but the cost to the giver. God measures the value of the gift by the sacrifice uh, involved. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, David famously turns down uh, a sacrifice that was to be given to him. He says, I'm not going to offer God something that has cost me nothing. So that teaches us that there is to be in some way a sacrificial element to our giving. Uh, so when we think of our means or, or our motive or how much is going to be left after a contribution, we begin to understand why this widow is such a great teacher for us because of the example and the precedent that she set. So is your contribution sacrifice? Is it harmful a little bit? Does it sting a little bit when you give of your livelihood? Uh, on, on a day like today when we come together and we, uh, we take up a contribution. There were some who didn't break a sweat when they gave. Yeah, I mean, you, you go back. There were many rich people who put in large sums of money. Plenty of people who didn't even think twice about it, but they are not the example that Jesus chose to highlight. And I also want to push this out of the financial because I hate preaching about money. It makes me feel itchy. Um, I want us to think about things that are, that are as if not more important. What about your time? Our time is precious, right? Our time is, is very possibly the most valuable asset that we have. When you give your time, does it sting a little? Is it sacrificial? Your effort. What about just stepping outside of your comfort zone? What about contributing your sense of comfort or security? Do you sacrifice that? Or do you stay in your nice little bubble where you always feel safe? Yes, the direct application, and I believe the intended application of this passage is talking about a financial contribution, but that does not mean that we can't make application elsewhere. If we are not giving of blank, whatever that might be, sacrificially, are we truly doing it in a way that is honoring to God? I can't answer that for you. I'd love to say, well, unless, you know, you're crying, you know, the guys come by with the contribution, you're like holding on to that check and there's a little tug of war. I'm not saying that that has to happen in order for your heart to be in the right place. In fact, I would vehemently discourage that unless you're sitting in front of me and I can film it on my iPhone. Um, <laughs> just kidding, Tom, Jeff, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't do that. Um, I, I'm not saying that it has to be this like heartbreaking ex experience for you, but the point of sacrifice is that it is sacrificial. Um, so I would encourage us to at least think about that. What we also see is the importance of a person is not going to be determined by what we can 
by. All right, divine approval is not about doing the most or being the best or, or giving the most. So this competitive spirit, while it can be certainly valuable in other aspects of our life, it can certainly help us to get ahead uh, academically, professionally, certainly athletically. I mean, there are a lot of ways where a competitive spirit is, uh, is, is valuable and, and, and can be helpful. It is not when garnering favor from God. I mean, was the widow highlighted in Scripture because of what she had? Obviously not. But her devotion was certainly worthy of our attention, so much that Jesus saw fit to bring that out. Who else would give away their next meal? Very possibly their, that night's shelter the way that she did. The poorest among us can be rich in the kingdom as long as we understand what is important. And I know that we know this, all right? I'm not intending or I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. We have to know what's important. That's one of those like stitch it on a pillow phrases that I, I wonder, do we allow it to mean anything? You know, when I tell you, come on, we just have to remember what's important. You're like, yeah, Judge, thanks for that. Uh, what's next? Reach for the stars. You know what I mean? It's, it, almost sounds, it almost sounds cheesy uh, to, to say it like that. But do our lives exemplify that we truly value that which is important? Do you want a good test for this? Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Where do you put your effort? I mean, you, you don't have to convince me. In fact, it's completely pointless for you to try to convince me. It's really pointless for you to try to convince anyone because our behavior indicates what we value. Where we spend our time, that's what we think is important. Where we spend our money, that's what we think is important. Where we put our effort, that's, that's how we know what we think is important because that's what we're working toward, right? So if we want to check, uh, you know, kind of check, uh, you know, check the temperature of our sacrificial giving, just take a look at the last seven days at where your time, money, effort, intentions, all of that energy uh, has gone. There's another, this is a weird application, but I think the scriptures give it to us. Um, the idea that you can choose voluntary poverty and, and do so to serve God is, is, is certainly something that God approves of. Now, I'm not saying that it's necessary, so I want to be very clear about that. Um, the reason I think it's important to bring up, as odd as it may sound, is because how many people today would be critical of the widow? How many of us, honestly, if we're sitting here knowing that you know, somebody has four bucks left to their name, and they go and they drop it in or they give it to someone, how many of us are legitimately going to be saying, well, that's a little over the top, don't you think? That seems a little excessive. Surely God doesn't expect her to starve just so that she can give. I bet she's only doing that so people will feel sorry for her. You know, it's, I mean, I, I don't think God expects us to be fanatics like that, right? And I'm not talking about worldly people. I'm talking about Christians. How many of us Christians would be critical for the, uh, you know, for the level of commitment or, or devotion that she shows, saying that, he, that uh, you know, she shouldn't go overboard, that she's being, that she's being irresponsible, but the idea of choosing poverty to serve God is 100% biblical. I'm not saying that it's necessary. I'm saying that it has happened, and it has been, and God has shown approval. Uh, Luke 58, or sorry, Luke 9:58. Jesus chose this life. He counseled others to do the same in uh, Luke 18:22. He told the rich young ruler, "Go sell all that you have, not all that you have left over, but go sell all that you have and come uh, follow me." It helped the disciples trust in God's providential care. Uh, in Matthew 6, verses 31 uh, through 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the idea that we could choose to serve God as opposed to choosing uh, even a comfortable lifestyle, again, I'm not suggesting that it is required, but it's certainly an option, and it's certainly an option that is undeserving of our criticism. So let's think about that the next time we are tempted, perhaps, to use the word fanatic or over the top or holy roller, right? We love saying stuff like that, uh, usually when the, the righteous behavior of others tends to convict us a little bit. And while it may not be required and certainly is not necessary for, uh, for everyone, it is absolutely something that God is approving of. We don't have to do it in order to serve him. 
But hopefully, at the very least, it will help us to remember that the things that take our time, our money, and, uh, you know, our energy away from God, you know, work, vacation, sports, I mean, even families, God gave us those things. God gave you the job that you had. Did he give you that job so you would spend less time worshiping him? No. God blessed you with the financial security that you have. Did he bless you with that financial security so that you would be less generous? No. God gave you the uh, talents or the abilities that, uh, that you have. Did he give you those so that you would use them for yourself and not to bring glory to him somehow? Absolutely not. God blessed you with a wonderful family. Why? So you would use them as an excuse not to serve him? Absolutely not. God gave us what he gave us so that we could honor him better, so that we could honor him further. So if we are using blessings as an excuse not to be uh, diligent in our service to God, then we are missing the point completely, as, it, as did, I'm sure, many who watched this poor, um, this, this, this poor widow give away everything that she had to her name. And I think finally, the, the last lesson that we're going to take a look at is that even though Jesus might not necessarily be physically seated at the money box still, he is interested in how we give. And again, I will expand, this is my expansion or my application, I will expand the application beyond money, even though the direct context is certainly about um, the giving. I mean, the giving of Ananias and Sapphira certainly did not go unnoticed as they were uh, punished for their selfish contribution in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Those, ha who, uh, however, who give the way that they're supposed to, liberally and cheerfully, are definitely noticed. We read about that uh, in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, and 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, <coughs> where we read, among other things, that God loves a cheerful giver, so we know that there is a certain attitude with which we are to come to the table when it comes time uh, for us to give. The point is, is that he notices. For better or for worse, God is aware of what we do. So... Don't think that uh, we are hidden in shadow through our faithfulness or lack thereof in this life. I wonder how many people think just like those giving out of their abundance. I think of the many rich people who put in large sums of money. Do we, do we give of money or time or effort or energy or compassion and say, you know what? I've got plenty of this. I've got time for this today. Oh, here's this one thing I'm really good at. I'm going to go jump in there and call it sacrifice. Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swoop in here and be of service doing something that I love and something that I was going to do anyway and just put that check right next to the box and say, yay, I'm being sacrificial with a smile on our face. Is that how we give? Is that how we exhibit generosity and service in our lives? I can afford it, so I'm cheerful about it. You know, I mean... Uh, it would probably be easy for us if God said, I require of thee $3.90, which was that really bad math problem that I did a second ago, so just go with me on that. There's not a person in here who, if they felt that $3.90 was all they needed to do in order to make God happy, you would write that check 500 times. In fact, actually, I need to talk to you if you're writing a $3.90 check, but you know, you'd drop that four bucks into the basket 100 times over, right? You think, wow, this <laughs> Being a Christian thing is a piece of cake. This is fun. That is not sacrifice. Is she arguing with me? Okay. Yes. You're not going to be the first little kid to argue with me today. I promise you that. That is not sacrifice. God doesn't need your money. All right? You're not the only person who can be generous or kind or teach the gospel or be of service. All right, we are not special because of what we can do. We are special because of what God can do through us. So is your giving in any context sacrificial? Because God ultimately wants sacrifice. Because when we sacrifice, we have to trust him. So is that how you give of your money? Is that how you give of your time? Is that how you give of yourself? And I realize that maybe it will take some training for us to cultivate these ideals in our lives if we haven't already done so. Uh, and, and I realize that, uh, you know, growth is a spectrum. It doesn't happen 
just with the snap of a finger. As easy as that would be, that's not how it works. But the mindset, the change of heart can happen much quicker. And it becomes much easier when we remember what has been given to you just to have this opportunity. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what you're doing here this morning. All right. We have a lot of our members here. We have a lot of visitors here. Uh, it's Mother's Day. It, 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 it's an amazing day. But what brought you here this morning? Not what motivated you or how did you decide what to wear or anything like that, but everything that got you to this moment today is a gift from our great God, is it not? So what are you going to do with that? How are you going to invest that blessing? And for some of us, maybe it means we need to be baptized for the first time. For some of us, maybe it means we haven't been here in a while and we need to... You know, we need to come back. There's something, there's something in our lives that we need to fix. You know what? That's fine. We're ready for that too. For some of you, maybe you are doing your best to put forth a smile, but it's taken all you got. And you just need to be reminded that you belong to something here. And that you're part of a family. So if there's anything that we can do for you, from encouragement to prayer, if you just need a hug, they're free into one. I mean, we're here for it. Just let God work in your life this morning. Let us help if in any way we can. Make your request known today by coming to the front as together we stand and while we sing. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning, and I guess the first thing to say is Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Uh, if I didn't say that, we would all be in trouble. So, uh, But no, it's just been a great day. Uh, thank you, Josh, for your lessons today and for all those that participated. Uh, we have an extremely large number of visitors this morning, and we are so grateful you are here. You're our honored guest. And we hope you stay around for a few minutes and let us get to talk to you and get to know you a little bit better. And we're sure thankful that you're here. Um, got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, one, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at Red Zone is the ladies' brunch. Um, then on Tuesday, there is a ladies' dinner at Lou Rander's house. Uh, please, no, at <laughs> RSVP to Lou. That's what it is, RSVP to Lou, uh, so that you'll know. But anyway, there's a uh, ladies' dinner at the, plaza. at the plaza, okay? I did not have, that was not written down anywhere, so I did not know. <laughs> all I had was your name, Lou, that was it, so you were, it was all you. But RSVP to Lou to know that you're going Tuesday night. Uh, 
one other thing, and as far as prayers go, uh, tomorrow, Amy Smitherman's uh, grandmother is having her funeral at 2 o'clock at the West Side Chapel at Lake Ridge Methodist. Uh, so let's remember that. That's at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, I don't have any other announcements this morning. Uh, it's just good to see everybody here. We've got quite a few traveling, uh, so we need to remember them. Uh, if there's anything else that needs to be mentioned, get with me right after service, and we will get it mentioned tonight. Uh, let's all be back tonight, 6 o'clock. We have singing night. Uh, so all you song leaders, let's show up tonight so to help us out. And then again, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we have our Bible study. So at this time, if everybody will bow with me. To our mighty Heavenly Father, as we come together at this close of this service, we are so thankful, Lord. You have given us so much, the blessings we have, both physical and spiritual. Put us under the, the fact that we do not understand everything but that you have blessed us so much. You gave us your son who came down upon this earth, who died for our sins, that gives us a hope of eternal life. But these blessings that we have, we have this church that allows us to come together, that you established for people of like mind to build one another up, to have fellowship. We are so thankful, Lord, for all that you've given us. We ask, Lord, that you be with Amy's family, that they are comforted in the loss of her grandmother. We know, Lord, that you are always with us, that you guide us and you guard us and you direct us. We ask that you forgive us when we come up short and you be with us till we come again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>